Hello, everybody. Um, so this week we are reading Jack Kerouac, who is probably the most recognizable figure of a counterculture movement from the late 1950s, early 1960s, called the Beat Generation. Um, the purpose of my lecture today is to try to place this movement in some kind of historical context and to talk to you about their influences, um, especially Buddhism, which is in some ways kind of the religion of the American Romantics. So first, um, here's a timeline to kind of show you how everything we've read so far relates to each other. Um, thus far, Emerson's Divinity School Address is the earliest thing we've read. Um, we've spent most of the class kind of in the dead center of the uh, 19th century. But as you are beginning to see our other assigned readings, either in their setting or in their date, their production date, are beginning to cluster around these other two points in the history um, in history in the middle or near the end of the 20th centuries, um, which, as I argued in the Dead Poet Society lecture, can be seen as moments of romantic resurgence. Uh, Jack Kerouac was born in 1922, making him just old enough to have served in the Second World War, and he served very briefly in the Merchant Marine Corps. Um, and he is one of the older figures in the Beat Generation, along with William S. Burroughs. Um, he had a fairly tragic life um, and was beset by tragedy from a very young age. When he was four years old, uh, his brother Gerard died of something called rheumatic fever. And this was an experience that made a very deep impression on him. Um, he was a football star in high school and he attended Columbia University on a scholarship, but he ultimately lost his spot on the team following a leg injury. And it's actually been speculated um, that Kerouac's later mental health problems and alcoholism may actually have been attributable to the multiple head injuries that he suffered, both as a football player and from an assault that he experienced in 1958. Um, he would actually die at the age of 47 from an internal hemorrhage, um, likely associated with his alcoholism. Um, which means that um, unlike Allen Ginsberg, unlike Gary Snyder, um, his influence is fairly confined to these big years of his productivity to, to the 1950s. Um, Kerouac's alienation from the conformist and conservative culture of post-war America is very clearly evident in his writing, as you can probably tell. Just as an example, in chapter 13 of Bar Dharma Bums, he describes kind of a typical American neighborhood like this. He says, you'll see if you take a walk some night on a suburban street and pass house after house on both sides of the street, each with the lamplight of the living room shining golden, and inside the little blue square of television, each living family riveting its attention on probably one show, nobody talking, silence in the yards, dogs barking at you because you pass on human feet instead of wheels. You'll see what I mean when it begins to appear like everybody in the world is soon going to be thinking the same way. And the Zen lunatics have long joined dust, laughter on their dust lips. Um, so there's kind of this sense that everybody in the 1950s is kind of living this very cookie cutter life. You know, everybody's kind of doing the same thing. Identical houses, um, every family somewhat the same, every family watching television on their living room. Um, you know, a sense that there is um, no room for kind of more free thinking, uh, more nonconformist uh, ways of being. Um, so this alienation and desire to break free from mainstream society, to live more simply and in harmony with nature, to prioritize spirituality and poetry rather than traditional modes of success was characteristic of the Beat Generation, which is a name that is thought to have a few different meanings. Um, this group was beat, as in the sense of beaten down, beaten down by life and beaten down by the strictures of the American mainstream. You know, a generation that felt itself oppressed um, in post-war American society. Um, it also is often thought to reference like a musical beat, like a musical or ryth rhythmic beat, uh, um, uh, an, a component of rhythm. Um, because they used these more improvisatory poetry and prose styles that were inspired by the tradition of jazz music, which has a heavy element of improvisation. But beat could also mean beatitude or beatific, which is a kind of 
religious term that means blessing or blessed. There's this part of the New Testament called um, the Beatitudes in which the writer says, blessed are, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So we have the sense of beat of, as being oppressed, um, beat as in associated with jazz music as um, a, an improvisatory, spontaneous approach to art and to life. Um, and also beat in beatitude in the sense of beatitude in the sense of being blessed or as seeking to to bless other people. Um, Kerouac's novels were drawn from real life. Um, he wrote mostly from the perspective of a fictionalized version of himself, um, retelling his adventures with fictionalized versions of his friends. Um, the same individuals appear in many of his novels. In On the Road, Kerouac's fictional avatar is Sal Paradise, whereas in Dharma Bums, he is Ray Smith. Um, Jaffe Ryder is real poet and environmental activist Gary Snyder, who's pictured on the bottom here, um, and who, by the way, is still alive. He's 90 years old um, right now. Um, Alva Goldbrook is the renowned poet Allen Ginsberg, and many other characters are stand-ins for additional although maybe somewhat less famous members of the Berkeley beat poetry um, scene. Um, the relationship between Gary Snyder slash Jaffe Ryder and Jack Kerouac slash Ray Smith is at the center of this novel. So I think it's just worth saying a few words about Snyder himself. Um, his backstory is pretty much as described in the book. Um, he was born in 1930, so eight years younger than Kerouac um, to a family that was driven into poverty by the Great Depression. Um, they lived more or less off the land in rural Washington state on the West Coast. Um, though Snyder developed this really deep interest in reading as a young child. He, when he was seven years old, he had um, some kind of injury um, and that required him to basically stay in bed for a long period of time. And so he started reading and started um, trying to acquire as many books and read as much as he possibly could. Um, also, his family apparently had some contact with the Native American people who were living in that region, um, and he became very interested in their way of life. Um, at the age of 17, he was awarded a scholarship to Reed College, and there he began writing poems and also conducting research on in Native cultures, um, specifically on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation in Oregon. Um, it was also there that he became very interested in Buddhism, and he would later enroll at the University of California at Berkeley to study Asian languages and cultures, which is where he met Jack Kerouac and a lot of these other um, a lot of these other people. Um, I say all of this partly because when I teach this book, many students are quite eager to assume that all the characters in these books are kind of dilettantes, that they're merely dabbling in Buddhism and environmentalism, and especially just kind of using Buddhism to justify whatever hedonistic desires they are seeking to gratify. And I un that's an understandable reaction, given what many of them do. There's a lot of drinking, you know, a lot of um, partying, a lot of what we would think of as somewhat, you know, irresponsible or hedonistic behavior. Um, but I think it's a mistake um, to see them as somehow not serious about what they are doing um, or only believing what they believe in order to justify kind of self-indulgent behavior. Um, Gary Snyder especially um, really did become a very accomplished scholar in this field. Um, he studied under major Japan Japanese American and Chinese American professors studied Asian languages, became a translator of Japanese poetry, um, and traveled back and forth between um, Asia and the United States in order, in order to study the culture and religion. Um, in fact, his early efforts to travel to Asia were actually stymied by the State Department during the McCarthy era. They refused to issue him a passport on the grounds that he was a suspected communist. But he did eventually end up spending time studying in both Japan and India he translated many Zen texts. He worked with lots of Asian scholars. Um, and he also really did spend the summers of his youth climbing lots of mountains and being a, a fire lookout. So he was an accomplished outdoorsman, as well as a very, very knowledgeable person, um, an expert on Buddhism and on Asian languages and culture. Uh, the picture on the left, by the way, is from right around the time that Dharma Bums takes place. So it's helpful to remember 
these people were very young. In fact, Jack Kerouac was one was probably one of the older people in this circle at the age of about 30. Okay, so these are the people you're reading about are all fairly young people, not that much older than you. I think when you read about Jaffe Ryder, it's very easy to picture him as as an older person, um, as someone with more experience because he teaches Ray Smith so much. But in fact, in real life, Jack Kerouac was eight years older. Um, and Jaffe is really not much older than most of you. Um, so some of their behavior, I think, can be at least partially explained by youth and not necessarily just by like a lack of seriousness. Um, the Beats, of course, are heavily associated with San Francisco and Berkeley and with locations like the City Lights bookstore pictured here. Um, at this point, I, I feel like I should tell this story that the last time I taught this class, um, we had a student, it was 2018, and we had a student who was a fourth year student at the time, Darya Bakareva, who some of you may remember. Um, and she was a big fan of Jack Kerouac, a big fan of the Beats, and had a dream of going to do a PhD program at Berkeley. And right at the time when we were reading this book for my class, she was actually in San Francisco doing her um, campus visit. I'm going to interview at Berkeley um, for their PhD program. And as she was sitting down to write a paper um, for one of the assignment deadlines um, about this book, um, she received her invitation to come be a PhD student at Berkeley. Um, and all throughout that week, she was sending back photographs of different locations in San Francisco that she had been to um, that were associated with Kerouac and the Beats. So like it's it's San Francisco is a, a place where you can very much feel their influence still. Um, and if you uh, are if you like this kind of thing, it's it's kind of a mecca. You know, it's, it's sort of like what Paris was um, for the modernists, you know, where if you were into Gertrude Stein or into Gertrude Heming or into Ernest Hemingway, um, you want to go to Paris and be at all the cafes that they visited. Um, if you're into the beat generation. Um, then you want to go to San Francisco and go to City Lights Bookstore, which is pictured right here, and to all the places where these people hung out. Um, so the Gallery 6 reading, which is portrayed in the novel, was actually a real and very important event that helped publicize the work of a lot of these poets, who up until that point had just mostly been writing for their friends. So this was um, an event that helped kind of um, make this poetry known to the world. So Alva Goldbrook reading his poem, Whale, is just Allen Ginsberg reading Howl, which is one of the foremost achievements of mid 20th century American poetry, period. Um, so it should also just be very unsurprising that these writers were inspired by the very authors that you have been um, reading. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Ginsberg has a poem in honor of Walt Whitman. Um, and of course, they all were um, interested in Thoreau and Emerson, Dickinson and Melville, who, will we, who we will read later on. Um, so I also just want to say a little bit about Buddhism in the United States, since it plays such an important role in this book. Um, it arrived in North America in the 19th century by a few different routes. Um, through immigrants from the countries where Buddhism is traditionally practiced, um, China, Japan, India, etc., um, by way of European and Anglo-American scholars and translators um, who studied this stuff and wrote about it and thereby made it known to people in North America. And then by way of European missionaries who were missionaries in East Asia and you know, would write home about uh, the practices that they saw there. So this is how um, uh, people in the United States found out about Buddhism, learned about it and, and knew what it was. Um, the first translation of a Buddhist text in the United States was the publication of the Lotus Sutra in the transcendentalist publication, The Dial, in 1844. The Dial was the publication founded by Ralph Waldo Emerson and other transcendentalists. As you can probably tell from Thoreau, the transcendentalists had a deep interest in Eastern religions and in Buddhism. Um, the first Buddhist temple in the United States was built in San Francisco by Chinese immigrants in 1853. Um, and it also shouldn't be surprising given geography that most of the Buddhists who immigrated to the United States lived on the West Coast, so lived in California. 
Um, Americans also became more aware of other religions, um, thanks to the monumental work of Lydia Mariah Child um, in a, a big work called The Progress of Religious Ideas Through Successive Ages that really kind of kicked off the study of comparative religion in the U.S. And then more European translations and scholarship started to get imported in the late 1850s such that by the 1870s, conversion to Buddhism becomes somewhat common in the United States. And by common, I don't mean that there's a huge number of people converting to it, but it remains a minority religion in the US and it accounts for less than 1% of the population. But nevertheless, there is a phenomenon of people converting to Buddhism in the US. Um, a lot of practitioners of Buddhism in the US are people who consider Buddhism to be their religious affiliation are not actually Asian, are not um, from the countries where Buddhism is traditionally practiced. Um, so religion scholar Thomas Tweed, who also is actually one of my mentors, he was on my dissertation committee, he divides American Buddhists into three types. There's the esoterics or mystics, and these were people who mixed Buddhism with their interests in lots of other alternative forms of spirituality, like theosophy or spiritualism, which was just talking to ghosts. Um, there were the rationalists who were generally disillusioned with Christianity, but still wanted to find some kind of spiritual practice that worked for them and that suited their particular beliefs and their, you know, but that wasn't Christian. Um, and so this worked for them. Um, and then there were the romantics who were attracted to Buddhist culture kind of as a whole, not just the tenets of belief, but basically everything that came with it. So they might become very interested in the culture of a particular Buddhist nation like Tibet or Japan um, and seek to mimic, mimic many other cultural practices along with the religion. So it's probably easy to tell which group the characters of Dharma bums belong to. Um, they're kind of very squarely within this romantic tradition. Um, again, just an overview of um, Buddhism in case um, this is an unfamiliar topic to you. Um, you may already know this, but it was it originated in India um, and spread throughout the continent. And like Christianity, it takes many different forms. Um, some of them are specific to particular regions. Um, the characters in this novel are adherents of Mahayana Buddhism, so the branch on the left, um, which is the branch that is a focused on the achievement of enlightenment. Okay, so we're we're looking to achieve nirvana. Um, the core beliefs of Buddhism are known as the Four Noble Truths. The first is the truth of suffering, which is thought to be just an inescapable fact of existence. Um, being a part of the cycle of life and death means that you experience suffering, period. Um, the second truth is the origin of suffering, which is desire, um, our attachment to impermanent things and states. Um, even things that give us pleasure can also become a source of suffering. Love can become a source of suffering. Um, uh, companionship can even become a source of suffering. Even, even something like sitting in a chair. You know, sitting in a chair might be comfortable for a very, very brief period, but can be suff become suffering, can become agony if, if I sit in this chair for a really, really long time. Um, the third noble truth has to do with the cessation of suffering which is that we can be free of all of this if we just give up our attachment to these impermanent things, if we are able to relinquish our desire for them. By achieving nirvana, we become also free from the cycle of life and death. We'll no longer be reborn into this world to experience suffering one again. And the final truth is the means of attaining this state. And it's by following the noble eight, the, the, the eightfold path, which you can do a little bit more research on if you would like to. Um, other Mahayana concepts that come up in this book include the idea of the Buddha nature, which is this true self that enables anyone to become a Buddha. There's not just one Buddha, there are many Buddhas. Um, and you too can become a Buddha if you, um, again, relinquish all your attachment to impermanent things and achieve enlightenment. Um, and uh, you will also note that Ray refers to himself and to others as bodhisattvas. And a bodhisattva is a Buddhist who um, not only is committed to achieving enlightenment him or herself, but is also focused on helping others do so as well. And finally, you will see some references to the Pure Land in this novel, which is a belief of a particular Japanese branch of Mahayana Buddhism um, that says that basically chanting the name of the Amitabha Buddha 
will get you to be reborn in the pure land, which is a kind of heaven. Um, this was a kind of um, form of Buddhism that promised enlightenment or promised some kind of happy afterlife to people who couldn't necessarily live an ascetic or a particularly pure life um, on earth. So Jaffe is especially interested in Zen Buddhism, which also comes from Japan. And this is a branch of Buddhism that has a very rigorous focus on meditation, which is supposed to help an individual achieve insight. Um, so Zen is also known for its use of koans, which are like these mental puzzles or riddles that you are supposed to meditate on. And many of them have kind of this absurd or even somewhat nonsensical quality to them. So I've given you an example here. Uh, so this is the most spiritual work that we are going to read all semester. Um, in the online discussion thread, I'd be curious in knowing what, if anything, strikes you as particularly romantic about the form of Buddhism you see practiced in the novel. And I mean, not just romantic in the sense that I said earlier, quoting from Tweed, but, um, but uh, also generally, you know, according to the definitions that we've been given by um, Isaiah Berlin and Jacques Barzun and others. Um, and secondly, um, I'm curious what differences you see between the way that Ray Smith, who is Kerouac in the book, and Jaffe Ryder, who's Gary Snyder, apply Buddhism to life. Okay, so um, I look forward to having a discussion with you, um, and we'll see you in the discussion forum.